Welcome to ASM Live at the 2014 American Society for Microbiology meeting in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Stanley Malloy. I'm your host today. And we're going to talk about some important, interesting, and sometimes surprising findings in microbiology. We want this to be conversational, so we encourage any of you in the audience to come up to the microphone if you have questions. And those of you who are listening on the internet, please send in your questions to hashtag ASM2014. Today, we're going to talk about emerging infectious diseases and the threat of those diseases. It seems like recently there's a continuous stream of new diseases that we hear about in the media, from Hanta, SARS, West Nile, and now MERS, and many other very important infectious diseases that sometimes don't get as much media coverage, despite their impact on humans. So we have two guests with us today who are going to help us explore this issue. The first is Ian Lipkin. Ian is from the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. And in addition, we have Lyle Peterson from the Centers for Disease Control in Fort Collins, Colorado. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. So maybe we should get started by asking the real basic question. Are we really seeing more emerging diseases? Are we simply detecting diseases more readily? Um, I would say a little bit of both. Um, certainly, we are detecting more diseases. For example, the Heartland virus, uh, which is the first pathogenic flebovirus found in North America. And uh, that was probably there all along. And I think there's, that story is still unfolding. We just happened to discover it quite by accident using next-gen sequencing. But there are a variety of new uh, diseases coming around. Um, I think the good example right now is chikungunya virus in the Western Hemisphere, which is just taking off by leaps and bounds right now. So it's, a, it's kind of a combination of the two. I'd agree, Stan. I think there's, uh, there's no question but that ascertainment is better because we have tools with which we can pursue surveillance and discovery, which we couldn't have done otherwise. But in addition, the world has also changed. So as a result of uh, changes in urban landscapes and movement into areas of the world where we previously didn't come into contact with animals, with international trade and such, there are opportunities not only for new diseases to emerge, but also to rapidly spread. So again, I agree with Lyle. I think it's a bit of both. So, so what do you think is the driver behind those changes? Obviously, increased transportation is something everybody can think about, but what else? I think it's, it's anthropogenic. I think we all agree that, that we are the cause of this. It's like, uh, you know, the, you know, the uh, I'm just trying to remember there was this old cartoon strip that said we've met the enemy and the enemy is us, right? It's, the fact is that we have changed the way we harvest foods, the way we transport foods, the way we handle meat products. Um, factory farming is, a, is very, very difficult, whether you're talking about um, vertebrates you're, you know, uh, on land or you're talking about mariculture, it's, it's very similar. Um, we overuse antibiotics. We've opened up jungles where there have been all sorts of things that have been uh, previously cryptic. Uh, so there are a whole host of things, I think, that make that difference. But I would not underestimate uh, globalization itself so that many things that would have remained you know, in one area of the world are now distributed way around the world, whether it's through movement of people or animal products or fruits and vegetables, all of these things pertain. Since, since you mentioned clearing jungles, I should just give a plug for the movie Contagion that you were oh, a yeah. consultant on, which shows in the last minute or so after the credits a beautiful mm -hmm. example of that. And there will be a television show that's coming out on AMC, which will take off where Contagion left. And it's a great story. So um, it'll probably take another year or so before the pilot comes out. It's not going to be exactly the same. It's going to be more interesting. It's going to have more sexual innuendo and politics. <laughs> <laughs> Though from Contagion, just for those that sort of, sort of the, uh, so that you'll know, at the very beginning of that movie where you hear the voice, the disembodied voice talking to Gwyneth Paltrow, discussing their assignation, that voice is Steven Soderbergh. And there's no other place you can actually hear him. 
uh, in any other picture that I know of. So it was sort of his Alfred Hitchcock movement, you know, to sort of integrate himself into the film. So if you see the film or you hear the film again, you hear that voice, that's Stephen. That's great. So, so Lyle, what do you view as being, you mentioned one example, what do you view as being the biggest threats that are facing us right now in terms of these emerging diseases? Well, I think for the Western Hemisphere right now, it's un undoubtedly, at least for the vector-borne diseases, it's uh, chikungunya virus, uh, which um, genetic evidence suggests that it came from a traveler from Asia. Um, it came to the island of um, St. Martin in October. October was the first cases, and now we've up to 51,000 cases within a matter of months. It's spread to 12 countries, and will keep on spreading and undoubtedly cause millions of cases before it's all over. Um, this is a huge threat to the tropical Americas, but also a threat to the, the contiguous states as well. As, as travelers are coming in, we have the right kind of vector mosquitoes in parts of the country. And so we do expect outbreaks to happen. So this is a great example of a, a very important new emerging disease that you rarely see in the mainline media. Right, exactly. It, it, it's, I have to say I have MERS envy, because MERS has three cases. I've got 51,000, and I'm getting no attention. But, but, um, but uh, I think. We're, we're, we're as a society not very aware of what happens outside our own country. And uh, so I think a lot, of, a lot of pathogens are emerging overseas and we just don't know about it. Or not, it's not on our radar screen until it comes here. And it's something that we at, at CDC and, and our, par our academic partners are trying to do is trying to get a a lead on this by trying to figure out what, what really is going on in other countries, increasing the surveillance, increasing the microbiology. And so we can have a little bit more advanced warning of what might come. Ian, do you think that kind of advanced warning is in the cards? Is that something that we will see in the near future? Well, yeah, I, but before we get into the issue of the future of surveillance, um, I want to say that I think the biggest threats facing us right now are really related to antibiotic resistance. Although I'm a virologist and I'm not supposed to say that, this is really my view uh, because it's going to require a, a cultural sea change in the way we use antibiotics and we've been pushing this now, as you know, for decades and we may finally be making some headway. With respect to vector-borne diseases, I think chikungunya is, a, is an excellent example of challenges we face. I'm uh, more concerned, frankly, about dengue than I am about uh, any of the other vector-borne diseases, unless we were to see something emerge like urban yellow fever, which would be a disaster. And that, you know, during the founding of this country, that was a huge issue. Um, and I wouldn't worry about your MERS envy. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, chikungunya is coming around, and uh, there's no question but that there's going to be interest in that. With respect to MERS, um, it is true that um, this particular agent has probably been around for a long time, just like Heartland virus, and it may just have become come into recognition recently because, you know, we've had ways to look for it, and it was discovered almost serendipitously. But this, you know, whenever an agent like this type emerges, there is the risk that it will change, it will adapt to humans, it'll move out of the lower respiratory tract the upper respiratory tract, and then we could have a very different situation. So it's important that we maintain that focus. It's also important to recognize that that focus has been responsible for a change in culture and leadership within Saudi Arabia, so that we're finally now getting some insights into how that particular agent is spreading and the mechanisms by which it causes disease. And it was almost a year where we learned very little and I know that from personal experience, having been there, having, having had difficulty rescuing specimens. So finally now there are international organizations, CDC, Frederick Loeffler, Robert Koch Institute, Institute Pasteur, that are becoming engaged in helping to address these things. The international health regulations of the UN, of WHO, state that diagnostic capabilities must be universal, information and samples must be shared, uh, and this is a commitment to which all the partner states have signed on. 
And with this sort of sign-on and the improvements in diagnostic methods, I think we will ultimately have an international immune system. And that's, in fact, what we need. So can we come back to something that you said that I think is a, a very important concept? You said MERS has been around for a long time. How do we know and how long? Why, why do you say that? Well, I shouldn't have said MERS. I should have said MERS coronavirus. The, the, the actual syndrome may not have been around for a long time, and that's what MERS means. But we know based on serological data, going back through records of samples and databases and sample banks as far as 1991, that that particular virus, or one very, very similar, has been existing, has been present in dromedaries. And I suspect that if we look outside of Saudi Arabia, should such sample banks exist, we would find it there too. Now, unfortunately, when you want to go look at human materials, because there isn't a pr prolonged viremic phase and those samples aren't retained anyway from humans, we can't easily go back and test those. We could do some serology, and people are beginning to do that, but that again is just going to tell you that a related virus was present. But I'm confident, based on the work now that's been emerging from several laboratories, that either MERS coronavirus or something that's indistinguishable antigenically from MERS coronavirus using the methods we now have has been around since at least in the early 1990s. Okay. We have a question from Twitter. Um, actually, it's from the hash room, I'm sorry, from the chat room, and uh, by his handle, I'm guessing this will be from Gary Taranzos. Uh, he wants to know, what can we say about the rebirth of polio because of war and the consequential social upheavals? This is something that needs to be addressed. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. I think this is a this is a, a political problem, more than more than a scientific problem. Although there are scientific aspects to this too. So, if you go back to the days when when smallpox was eradicated, the question is, what should the next agent be? And I'm told by people who are in on those early discussions that measles was suggested as the next obvious target. No good other you know, alternative reservoir for it, probably easily eradicated. One uh, vaccination should do it. But a decision was made to pursue polio because the March of Dimes and Basil O'Connor, who led the March of Dimes, was a close friend of FDR's, and so we pushed for polio. And we made enormous headway with polio. And then uh, we ran into these issues with fundamentalists who said that they were concerned about the polio vaccine being used to sterilize young women as a way of sort of decreasing certain populations. Uh, obviously, that wasn't true. Um, but, you know, fun, you know, people were able to push this particular hypothesis. And it didn't help very much when we used uh, the polio eradication campaign as a guise to try to get insight into the genetics of, you know, rel relatives of Osama bin Laden in an effort to find him, right? And, and so as a result, you have these poliovirus workers who, you know, who've actually been killed on the line of duty trying to do this sort of work. So it's very difficult whenever people begin to mix politics, politics plus religion, and public health. And we did ourselves an enormous disservice. Uh, and I'm not proud of what we did, frankly. Um, but, but Ian, I think that there are two parts to this, and probably everyone who follows the news is aware of, of that as an issue, the political, religious barriers to eradication of polio. But I think many people don't realize that there are scientific barriers as well. And, and I think that that really is an important issue. When it gets down to eliminating the very last cases of something where there are uh, where it can persist in the environment for a period of time, then you do run into bigger problems, right? So, and, th and that's very different than the case with smallpox. And with measles, we may well have been rid of measles, and instead we're now, because of anti-vaccine movements, seeing new outbreaks. Yeah, that's another tragedy. Um, I mean, I think if, if, if we could wind the clock back, um, and most people now would agree that we should have tackled measles next, right? I mean. Uh, and we're going to run into similar problems, I suspect, when we try to eradicate um, the relevant serotypes of HPV. It's going to be the same sorts of 
complaints, um, which are going to be religious and politically based. But I think the major challenge with polio really has been the political one, uh, more so than the scientific one, which is, a, again, I, say, I think it's a tragedy. So, so, Lyle, let's come back to speaking about uh, the arbol viruses in your specialty. One of the things that we often see is we see very low levels of disease for a period, and then they just seem to be a continuous part of our existence. West Nile is a great example of that, where at first it looked to be somewhat sporadic, and now it's virtually everywhere in the United States. Um, continuously. Yeah, I think, I think West Nile is a good example of what Ian was talking about, about <clears throat> creating an environment, <clears throat> excuse me, where these pathogens can exist where they shouldn't normally exist, and then having travel and trade move them in. I mean, I, but I think it was all surprising to us in the beginning when West Nile virus showed up in New York City, but in retrospect, it makes a lot of sense. Where are goods coming into the country in New York City? And then it spread rapidly throughout the country and is pretty much endemic throughout the entire U.S. at this point. But what's interesting is, is you, you get places like Phoenix, which is one of the hottest spots for West Nile in the country. And you're thinking, what is this tropical disease doing in the middle of a desert? And it's solely because of people and, um, and the irrigation. And um, so we're really changing the environment in such a way that these microbes could come. Once they come in, they can adapt. Um, now, with the arboviruses, it's, it's confusing because these, these enzootic cycles are so complicated in reality that it's hard to predict when these outbreaks are going to occur. But we're, we're getting a better handle on that. And again, it. it they're promoted by these larger issues. For example, this huge outbreak that we had in 2012, which was focused in Texas, but pretty much increased everywhere in the country, was caused by a massive heat wave. Uh, at least it was coincident with a massive heat wave. And every single large outbreak we've had has been associated with a heat wave. So you're, you've got to think, well, you know, what's climate change going to do to these pathogens? And climate change changes everything. It changes the flora, the fauna, and everything. So it's kind of hard to predict what will happen, but at least for the sh over the long run. But at least for the short run, as long as we keep having more and more heat waves, we're going to have more and more problems. So when West Nile virus started in 1999, we had a perfect storm for that. So as Lyle has mentioned, association with heat waves, 1999, we had a drought in the Northeast. People were not. Uh, discarding, you know, water and bird baths and so forth, they were saving it for their for their gardens and, and whatever that was they wanted to use it for outside. So as a result, you had this perfect incubation system for mosquitoes. There was a budding foie gras industry in Ramallah, in you know, in Israel or Palestine, depending on your political vantage point, where there was a big infection with the same virus that was ultimately identified. Uh, as the cause of the encephalitis outbreak in New York, where some 5,000 geese were infected. So you have this huge reservoir of virus. And you, of course, have plane traffic that goes directly from Tel Aviv to the U.S. But according to Derlin Fish, and I can't really, and this is his data, not mine, uh, there was a plane that went, was supposed to go to JFK, but instead it went via Toronto. And then from Toronto, people cleared Customs, then it went directly to LaGuardia. So the epicenter was at LaGuardia, not at JFK, which would fit with that particular scenario for those of you who know that part of Queens. So it's, you know, there's, they're all, so as I say, it was a perfect storm. Three things, you know, collaborated to set, you know, the stage for what we subsequently follow. So you said something that I think is non intuitive to a lot of people, and that is that sometimes a drought can increase the transmission of diseases that are associated with water, right? And yeah, it, and if you look at places like the Dominican Republic, for example, they have dengue outbreaks in the middle of dr the dry season simply because the water supply is not, uh, not secure, and so people store water. In the 80s, Egypt, I breed in containers around people's houses, and so you get swarms of mosquitoes no matter how dry it is. And, um, 
So exactly what's happening in Phoenix as well. I don't know if people are storing water, but they're certainly irrigating. It's a, it's a tropical environment in the middle of a desert almost. We have another question from the internet. Uh, yeah, this one comes from Twitter. And uh, Diana Hernandez wants to know, have you seen cases of dengue in the US given that it has moved all the way north to Mexico? And she notes that she's from Mexico and has had dengue. Um, we certainly have seen dengue in the U.S. We've had, in the last 15 years or so, we've had two outbreaks in Florida. The last one uh, last year, which involved about 25 cases, and uh, eight outbreaks in Texas. And what's really interesting is, is that you see these massive outbreaks on the Mexican side of the U.S. border. And then when you get to the U.S. side, there's hardly any dengue at all. And it's like there's a wall across the, that border. And, um, and so we've, we've, we've investigated now about four or five of these outbreaks. And it's really interesting because you actually find as many mosquitoes on the U.S. and the Mexican sides of the border. What the big difference is is that, that people on the U.S. side live in air-conditioned houses. And the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which spreads dengue, bites people indoors. So people are, are indoors, and they're essentially protected. It's just a lifestyle difference. And so it's probably the first time that television and beer and sitting inside of your <laughs> air-conditioned house has saved you from a disease. But um, so you know, it raises real question about, well, what's ch chikungunya virus, for example, who has the same transmission pattern, what's it going to do? when it gets to the US, is it going to be like a dengue, or is it going to be something worse? We don't really know. We have another question from the audience. So you briefly mentioned the, the, the problem of antibiotic resistance. And, and recently, there was a, a WHO report on, on the, the problem of antibiotic resistance. Um, and I'm wondering, is, is this kind of an, an inevitable global trend, or what can we do on a global scale to, to try to stem this, this emerging problem with infectious disease? Well, again, it's a, it's a political problem. Uh, one thing, I think, is that scientists have become more engaged with the public in explaining what it is we do and why this is important. Uh, and scientists, I'll tell you, who, do, who speak to media, uh, frequently are not considered serious scientists by their colleagues. And this is also an aspect of culture that needs to change. Um, Vincent Racaniello, who's sitting back there blogging furiously, is one of the people who's trying, who has a very popular podcast that's actually people who don't know anything at all about virology or have joined and are trying to understand uh, more about the world of virology. We need to do similar sorts of things in, uh, in popular media. Um, one of the ways I think in which we can do this is by engaging with people who are making games. I don't know, has anybody here played Plague Inc? So this is, you know, so James Vaughn has done us an enormous service. It's still a little bit rusty and, and I'm trying to help him uh, on, you know, making it a little more consonant with the sort of things we'd like to see in microbiology. But, but if we reach out in this way and we explain to people what the challenges are, why is it important? that we not use antibiotics as growth motors, which we've been doing since the 1940s, that this will have an impact. Um, but, you know, it's more expensive to grow animals that way. At least it seems that way. Um, but the real cost, if you amortize them across disease and all the other issues that we have to address as a result of overuse of antibiotics, I think will make a difference. Now, interestingly, in some countries, where they have very different regimes and they can make a decision that's just implemented, like China, they, uh, they're thinking about just making a decision, period. We're just not going to do this anymore. Um, but we can't do it quite the same way in the United States. There's also the overuse of antibiotics uh, in humans, right? But I don't think that's as large a problem as the overuse that we see uh, in animals. Can I add two things to what you said? One sure. is that a, a place where, in fact, there's been great success with antibiotic use in animals that is not due to a dictatorial regime it, are the Nordic countries. And they really have had success in reducing antibiotic usage and also reducing resistance of the microbes within the animal population and 
in the human population. The Nordic countries, so I do a lot of work in Oslo uh, and as well as in Sweden. And in Oslo in particular, it's, it's a very different situation. They have such vast resources than, and the population has a sort of a universal educational standard so that when a decision is logical, right, you know, it's much easier to promote it. I mean, in this country, we have a large number of people who still don't believe in evolution. So how are you going to persuade them that it's important mm -hmm. to think about antibiotic resistance? So we need better science education, uh, I think, and, and, and I think all of us uh, should commit to trying to talk to everyone that we know who's not involved in science to teach them what it is we do. This is important not only in terms of preserving public health, but it's also important in terms of preserving science. So the other thing I wanted to comment was a little plug. You mentioned Vincent Racaniello and the programs he has. For those of you in the audience who don't know, he runs a regular podcast this week in virology, this week in microbiology, and this week in parasitology. They have a tremendous scientific viewership, but also many people from the general public who are interested in learning these things that affect all of our lives. And the next question from the studio audience is Vincent. <laughs> it's not why I'm here, because you mentioned it, but thank you very much. <laughs> I wonder if you could talk about the notion that we'd like to learn everything that's out there, all the viruses that are out there, and how that would help us to be predicting what's coming next. Yeah, I think, I think, it's, I think that's not the right approach. You, you really can't run out there and try and discover every, every uh, pathogen, potential pathogen that's out there and somehow predict that it's, un, that it's gonna potentially cause an outbreak. I just don't think it works that way. And so our, I think a better approach is actually looking at, uh, looking at what's going on in people around the world because, that, that was pro because then you know you're dealing with a human pathogen and it's a much more targeted kind of approach. Figuring out what's causing acute febrile illness, let's say in Africa or Asia, you know, that's undiagnosed or uncharacterized. I think you can make a lot of progress doing that. Um, but if you look at all the pathogens, you know, that are emerging today, it would be very, very difficult to try and predict which ones are emerging at any given time. Who would have predicted MERS? Who would have predicted West Nile in, the, in New York City? You know, who would have predicted J uh, Zika virus? You know, a new one that's, that's growing up, you know, spreading like crazy in the Pacific. I mean, before that, there was just one isolate, you know, a handful of cases, you know, in Africa. You know, who could have predicted that? Nobody. And so it's really, to me, a better approach is trying to get a handle on really what's causing disease, what's actually causing disease in humans in other places, and figuring out what their potential is to spread here. I agree in part with Lyle, uh, a focused approach on uh, causes of disease in humans, but also in other animals, yeah. uh, is more likely to identify things that would be clinically relevant. On the other hand, um, I'm quite optimistic that as we begin to learn more about the evolution of viruses and bacteria, that we will ultimately come to principles that will allow us to make predictions about risk. We're not there yet. Uh, last year, we published a paper in which we uh, produced an estimate of uh, the number of viruses out that were yet to be discovered. The, the number was in excess of something like 300,000. Uh, that's almost certainly an underestimate. And we also attached a price tag <laughs> to that work, which is in excess of $16 billion, which I said was a bargain compared to what SARS cost us. Uh, it didn't necessarily help me with study sections. But, <laughs> but I think we do need to know much more. We need to inventory the tree of life. I didn't know that we have $16 billion to do it, but I think this is something that we should do more of. And one way in which we could do this would be to hierarchy, establish a hierarchy of those organisms, of those uh, potential hosts that we think are closest to us. So obviously primates are very important. But there are others that people don't think about as being important. 
uh, that clearly are. Uh, nobody does work, for example, in horses in discovery. I mean, very, I shouldn't say no one, but there isn't a great deal of it. Uh, and, you know, if you go back a couple of decades, we were making antitoxins in horses and injecting them into people. So any time there's any sort of an intimate relationship between humans and animals, that interface is an area we, where we should be looking. Additionally, people who sit at that interface, like abattoirs and hunters and farmers and such, are people who should also be surveyed serologically to look for evidence of cross-species transmission. So I think we have to do more than just look at people with acute disease. <coughs> That's probably number one, and it's always easiest if you have an outbreak, right, because then you've got a cluster where you can say all of these people have this and none of those people have that. That's the best case scenario, but that's what we always hope for. But then there are various other areas below there. At the very bottom of that list would be a complete tree of life of all the organisms, which obviously we cannot yet do. But we need to know much more about the principles that govern cross-species transmission. Uh, the Department of Defense had a program that was focused on this uh, called Prophecy, uh, to which, for which we did not apply, uh, because I said we needed to know much more about how viruses, which was their focus, evolve in humans before we can actually make predictions about where we should look and how we should look. We have another question from the studio audience. Um, my question is regarding the MERS and the coming pilgrimage season. Um, there will be millions of people flocking into Saudi Arabia. So how do we perceive the risks? And if we were to advise the Saudi government, what should we do? So um, I'm, I've been, I'm involved with that, um, that aspect um, and will be more so uh, over the coming months. And I think, you know, after a start that was uncertain, uh, we're now on the right track. If you go back to 2003, I'm going to answer all of your questions, but I just want to place it into context. In 2003, when there was a difficulty in communication between WHO and the Chinese government, we didn't really know what was going on. When you fast forward from 2003 to 2013 with recent influenza strains, there was transparency, release of strains, release of data directly because there was an appreciation that infectious diseases have no borders. In the early days of 2012 and 2013 with MERS, there was this, we did not have the kind of transparency that we now have. The new Minister of Health, who was brought in from labor, is committed to making certain that international bodies are brought in to address this challenge rapidly. Now, it is a concern, now when, when I went in 2012, uh, the first case, uh, the index case, was a gentleman who had four camels. And we began looking at camels. It was very difficult to import materials into the U.S. Uh, subsequently, the, uh, the group in Erasmus, um, uh, under Marion Koopmans, demonstrated that there were antibodies, and then a whole flurry of articles emerged, uh, including some from our group, where virus was recovered, which was key. And there's some new data that will be published shortly uh, that I can't really speak to because it's not really mine, but, it, but that will make the case even more strongly that camels are an important reservoir and vector for human disease. And I, I will tell you that those data which are coming from a, uh, a Saudi group are compelling and rigorous and I think will be useful in making the case that we need to deal differently with, with you know, camels and such. Now, we don't know that camels are the only vector for disease. There may be others. But we do know that they have infectious virus and that the vast majority of camels in Saudi Arabia have been infected and up to a third of young camels are infected. Now, as you said, during the Hajj, and that's not the only pilgrimage, there are other pilgrimages as well, you have something like three million people who come through Saudi Arabia and then after this uh, centripetal, you know, uh, gathering, then they go out to their various you know, homelands and have the ability to spread. Fortunately, there hasn't been any evidence yet of significant secondary spread after people return to their individual homes. I think that we're gonna see that there's gonna be some inappropriate surveillance recommended because people are gonna to wanna to have some false sense of security as a reuse of thermometers and other kinds of things. 
which is going to give us an enormous amount of noise. But we do need to monitor this virus closely uh, to examine uh, its potential to move from the lower upper airways, lower airways to the upper airways to become more capable of human to human spread. And I would suggest that the Saudi government move very rapidly toward insisting on pasteurization of camel milk, right? And concerns with the way these animals are butchered and clearly to avoid those camels, right? Where we have, uh, that are younger, those are the animals that are most likely uh, to be infected in our experience. Uh, and a lot, though, though there certainly adult camels are as well, but there's no reason that we cannot do simple PCR tests of all of these animals, right, that are used for these purposes, that are sacrificed, what have you, to make certain that there's no risk of meat contamination. And I don't know if you've been to Saudi Arabia or parts of the Middle East where people have these animals displayed, but you typically show the head of the animal is a way of indicating the age of the animal and the integrity of the animal so that people have confidence in the quality of the meat. That's something which culturally I don't think uh, we, can, we can allow anymore unless we're absolutely sure that there is no virus there. Otherwise, you have potential for all kinds of contamination. So again, the major challenges that I see are logistical and cultural and political rather than scientific in addressing that challenge. We are nearing the very end of our time, but one last question. Based on what you've said, you don't expect that this is going to be the next pandemic. Uh, yeah, but I don't have a crystal ball, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for future conversations, but I'd, I'd like to thank our guests. Lyle Peterson, thank you very much from yeah, the Centers for Disease Control and Ian Lipkin from Columbia University. Thanks, Dan. And I'm Stanley Malloy. Thank you for joining us on ASM Live. Please join us for one of our subsequent shows. Explore the fundamental role of microbes in natural history of our planet with Microbes in Evolution, the world that Darwin never saw. Available at eStore.asm.org.